Hi, it's Dwyer. Uh, I'm a lawyer here in Northern California, I'm also a real estate broker. You can find me at richarddwyer.com and at dwyerbroker.com. Right? Let's, uh, from time to time here on this channel, and this is the Dwyer Crime channel on YouTube, we look at famous cases and we ask the question of whether or not the person should have been convicted. Right? I believe, for example, that Reuben Hurricane Carter should have been convicted. I believe Amanda Knox should have been convicted. Understand, sometimes the authorities ultimately rule in a different way. I believe that Oscar Pistorius should have been convicted. Right? There are other people here, and just track all of the people we discuss, who I don't believe should have been convicted. Right? Sometimes the cases are provocative. You're looking through the information and you ask yourself, wow, you know, how should I weigh this piece of evidence? Other times they're not. Other times it's clear that a travesty of justice has taken place. Now let's forget all the press reports. Let's forget the nickname. Let's forget the focus on how the defendant here looked. Let's just look at the facts concerning the Lori Bambenic case. Right? Now, let me just say this. I don't believe this is a close case. I don't believe this is provocative. I think it's an absolute farce that Lori Bambenic was even put on trial. Right? This case really could only have existed in the pre-O.J. Simpson era, right? Today, I think a prosecution would have to sit down and any criminal defense attorney worth their salt would understand that they didn't have to accept the deal from the prosecution because the prosecution, in my opinion, wouldn't have had enough to go forward because of the degree to which the evidence was tainted. Now let's back up a second and let's just talk about the law. Understand that the burden of proof in a criminal prosecution is on the state to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? The evidence, the collection of the evidence has to have integrity. If the collection of the evidence doesn't have integrity, if you can't trust the evidence that the prosecution is relying upon, then you can't convict, right? If you have any reasonable doubts, you can't convict, right? As Johnny Cochran put it in the OJ trial, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Now here, the victim was Christine Schultz. Her husband, ex-husband, was a police officer. His name was Alfred Schultz, right? We'll call him by his nickname, Fred Schultz. Understand that Fred Schultz had a new wife, Lori Bambenek, right? Now, Fred Schultz's police partner, right? You're a cop, you have a partner. It's a guy named Michael Durfee. Now, here, let me offer a disclaimer. As many of these people are still alive, I'm not pointing a finger at anyone and alleging any specific misconduct, right? This isn't a video where I'm going to say to you, this guy is the murderer, or this woman is the murderer. No. Instead, what I'm going to do is just point out how tainted the evidence was. Why the evidence is so tainted, right, by the state itself, that really no one could have been convicted of this murder. Right? Now understand, let's talk about the crime. Fred Schultz and his former wife, Christine Schultz, have two sons. 
11 year old Sean, 7 year old Shannon. Now, they're in bed in the house that they share with their mother, Christine Schultz, on the night of the murder. Right? An intruder comes in the house. Right? The intruder seems to have a way into the house. Right? Seems to have a key. The intruder is in the house. The intruder, believe it or not, walks into the boy's bedroom. The boys see the intruder. Right? The intruder actually walks over to the boys, hushes them. Now at this moment, let's just freeze it right here. Understand that both boys, the 11-year-old and the 7-year-old, right? Both boys know Lori Benbenek. They know dad's new wife. They know what she looks like, right? They know how tall she is. Right? They know what she sounds like. They know her. Right? Neither boy believes that the person they saw, a man approximately six feet tall, with pale hair put back in a ponytail, wearing a bandana, right? Neither boy believes that the person they saw that night was Lori Bambanek. This is right before the murder takes place. Now the boys disagree on what the intruder was wearing. Right? Was it a jogging suit? Did the intruder have on a jacket? The boys can't agree on that. But the 11 year old is firm that the intruder was wearing shoes like the shoes owned by their mother's current boyfriend who was a cop, their father who was a cop, right? The boys are firm that the intruder, at least the 11 year old is firm, that the intruder was wearing cop shoes. So then the intruder leaves their room after hushing the boys, goes down the hall. They then hear a gunshot. Right? They run over to their mother's room. The intruder quietly leaves. Their mother has been shot in the back and gagged. The boys then call the mother's boyfriend, right? Law enforcement is then alerted. The investigation begins. The police know that one of their own, Christine Schultz's former husband, Fred Schultz, right, was upset with the party's divorce. Right? He was under a lot of financial pressure. Right? He was paying $383 monthly, big money back then, for his wife's mortgage. Right? Understand, we call it his wife's mortgage. Right? His wife continued to live in the house that used to be Fred Schultz's house. Understand, he was also paying an additional $365 monthly in child support. They question Fred Schultz, who would stand to gain both in terms of increased custody of his kids as well as financially and not having to pay alimony. Right? They question him about where he was. Right? Fred Schultz then lies to the police officers, or should I say the other police officers. Fred Schultz claims that he was out investigating a crime 
with his partner, Michael Durfee. Right? That turns out to be a lie. Let's be clear on it. Right? It's a lie. They then question Durfee. Eventually, the story comes out. Right? Fred Schultz and Durfee, at least according to Durfee, were at a bar. Right? They're at a bar. Drinking. Allegedly, at the time, Fred Schultz's former wife is murdered. Right? Now, incredibly, and I say incredibly, what happens next discredits the case. Right? Would you believe that five hours after the murder, presumably when these guys are still feeling the impact of having been at a bar, right? Would you believe that the police send these two guys, Fred Schultz, the person of interest, the person who would stand to financially gain from his ex-wife's murder, right? The person who had just had a contentious divorce with his ex-wife. Would you believe the cops asked him and his partner to go to his apartment to retrieve his off-duty firearm, right? When they get there, the partner notes that the gun does not look like it's been recently fired, that the gun is fully loaded, that the gun has dust on it, that the gun does not smell of gunpowder. Believe it or not, folks, the prosecution against Lori Ben Bennett then argued that it's this gun that her husband, Fred Schultz, and his partner retrieved from the apartment. It's that gun that is the murder weapon, according to the prosecution. Right? The prosecution would make the claim that Lori Benbenek was at the apartment, that she had access to the gun, Right, her husband's off-duty gun. And she had access to a key to Christine Schultz's house. That she knew where the husband kept the key and the off-duty gun. And that she used both that night to go kill her husband's ex-wife. Right, to alleviate her husband's financial problems. Right? Let's just say... Isn't it strange that a person of interest, her husband, who lied to the police about his whereabouts, would be the person who the police would ask to go get the gun? Isn't that odd to you? Let me say this too. Did you know that at some time later, Fred Schultz and Lori Ben Benick moved out of the apartment? They moved in someplace else. A plumber, we're not talking about the next day. We're talking about several days later. We're talking about weeks later. A plumber looking in the toilet, trying to solve the backup in the toilet, then discovers a red wig in the toilet's plumbing. This is weeks later. Let me ask you, especially given that Ben Benick and her husband had already moved out of the house, was the toilet backed up all that time? 
Did no one realize that the toilet was backed up? How many people used the bathroom during that period of time? How many people after Ben Benick and her husband moved out of the house used that bathroom, used that toilet? Well, if you believe the prosecution in this case, it's the red wig found in the toilet weeks after Ben Benick and her husband moved out of the apartment that was the wig that the murderer wore the night of Christine Schultz's death. Now, let's talk about the obvious holes in this case. Since in this post-O.J. Simpson world, we're actually focused on the integrity of evidence collected by police. Let's just ask obvious questions here. Can you really have a person of interest like Fred Schultz, who of course lied to the police about his whereabouts initially at the time his, of his wife's murder, right? Whose alibi is that he was at a tavern when he was supposed to be on duty, right? Or when he claimed to have been on duty. Should the state have had a person of interest like Fred Schultz collect evidence, right? How did the police have Fred Schultz, who had lied to them, go collect the gun that the state would later contend was the murder weapon? Doesn't that open itself up to a host of crazy possibilities? Right. Let me ask another question. How could the police have had Fred Schultz's alleged alibi witness, the guy who Fred claimed he was with at the time the murders took place, Mr. Durfee, right, who according to some reports may have initially lied to the cops himself when asked where he was with Fred, right? According to some reports, Durfee may have backed up Fred's story at first before owning up to the fact that they were in a tavern. How could they have had the alibi witness go to Fred's house with Fred to collect the firearm? Also, think about it. If these guys are claiming they were in a tavern five hours before going to collect the firearm, how could the cops have sent these two guys who had just been at a bar to collect the firearm just five hours later. Let me say this too. If Durfee's correct that the gun itself did not look like it had been recently fired, that the gun itself had dust on it, didn't smell of gunpowder. If the gun they collected that night was not used in the murder, then Lori Ben Benick couldn't have committed the murder. Right? Understand, if you believe the cop who the police sent there to get the gun, then Lori Ben Benick is 100% innocent. Now, would it startle you to know that the serial number of the gun that the police picked up that night was not recorded by the police? Isn't that sloppy work by the police? Isn't that work so sloppy that it absolutely negates their case? Right? You have a cop with, of course, the husband of the murder victim sent to pick up this firearm. Right? Incredibly. Of all the people in the Milwaukee Police Department, they send the victim's ex-husband 
and his alibi witness to go pick up the murder weapon. Right? The alibi witness firmly states that this weapon couldn't have been the murder weapon. Then, of course, when they bring that weapon in, they don't record the serial number. Right? In my opinion, that negates the entire case. Without the serial number, how do we know that this is Fred Schultz's off-duty gun? How do we? Let me say this too. Did you know that the gun they brought in was then returned to the apartment? Aren't you a little concerned here about the chain of custody? That the weapon they're contending was the murder weapon is actually a weapon they allowed Fred Schultz to have access to after they started their investigation. Would it further surprise you to learn that Michael Durfee, Fred Schultz's partner, his alibi witness, the guy who went with Fred Schultz to have retrieved the gun that night, threw away his investigator's notebook from the day of the murder in violation of police protocol? If you're a juror based on these facts, how could you take the prosecution seriously at this point in the investigation? Let me say this too. Let's talk blood splatter for a moment. You know the gun that they retrieved from the house didn't have any blood on it. But yet Christine Schultz was shot at point blank range. The actual gun used in the murder would have had blood on it from blood blowback. This dusty gun that was fully loaded and didn't smell of gunpowder, according to one of the Milwaukee cops that the police department sent to retrieve it. This gun also didn't have any blood on it. And isn't there an elephant in the room? Isn't this an obvious elephant in the room? They went to retrieve Fred Schultz's off-duty gun. The one that they didn't record the serial number for. Right? And by the they, I mean Fred Schultz and Michael Durfee, his partner, his alibi witness. Right? What about Fred Schultz's on-duty gun? Keep in mind, all of this is happening within a matter of hours. Right? Fred Schultz is back retrieving his gun. <laughs> right? Five hours after the murder. What about his other gun? What about the testing on his other gun? Folks, you're going to find out that his other gun wasn't fully tested. Think about that. Right? Isn't the prosecution here so sloppy? that there's a possibility that at some point guns could have been switched. Right? If there's any possibility that Fred Schultz's on-duty gun could have been switched for Fred Schultz's off-duty gun and that a gun other than the gun that was in the house with Lori Ben Benick that night was used for the murder, then doesn't that negate the entire prosecution? Hasn't the police left open that possibility by sending Fred Schultz and his partner to retrieve the off-duty gun? Hasn't the police left, over, left open that possibility by not recording the serial number on the gun they obtained, by releasing that gun back into Fred Schultz's 
possession. By not requiring Fred Schultz to turn in his on-duty gun for several days. Right? This is a beyond sloppy police investigation. Right? This police investigation to me is so bad that it mathematically eliminates any possibility that anyone could have been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me say this too. As if this wasn't bad enough, there are autopsy problems. Now, Lori Ben Benick dyed her hair blonde. Somehow the prosecution came up with evidence that there were dyed blonde hairs on the gag that was placed on the victim, Christine Schultz. Here's the problem with that, and it's a big problem. The person who conducted the autopsy of the body saw no such dyed blonde hairs on the gag that was used on Christine Schultz. In other words, someone from the state, a key player in all this, the person who performed the autopsy, is telling you that when they did the autopsy, those dyed blonde hairs were not there. In other words, if you believe the state's own witnesses, the alibi witness, who flatly says, this gun couldn't have been the gun used in the murder, right? No smell of gunpowder, dust on the gun, right? And if you believe the person who did the autopsy, no dyed blonde hairs. Then later, somehow, they're dyed blonde hairs. Right? Then, of course, in my opinion, that raises reasonable doubts that should have led to the acquittal. In fact, the doubts are so significant. In my opinion, Lori Benvenick should never have been tried. Finally, this might be the coup de grace. Did you know the person who did the autopsy claims that the marking on the bullet introduced into evidence at trial didn't match the marking on the bullet that she took out of the victim's body? Right? So understand this case is what I would call an extremely weak case. Right? There is no way that based on how this case was handled, Lori Ben Benick should have been convicted of this crime. Right? Absolutely no way. I don't see how the state, after sending the ex husband with his alibi witness, to retrieve the gun, and after failing to note the gun's serial number, right, could then make the argument, especially after that alibi witness says the gun they retrieved couldn't have been the murder weapon. I don't know how the prosecution could then try to make a case where they state definitively that that gun the one that they didn't even note the serial number on, so they don't even know if it's that gun. That Fred Schultz's off-duty gun was the one used in the murder. Also, I'm a bit surprised that the prosecution would feel that they could present a case against Lori Benbenek when the two kids who saw the murderer that night are on record as saying that the person they saw was not Lori Ben Benick. That's absurd. 
right? Understand, the person who did the autopsy doesn't support the prosecution's case. The kids don't support the prosecution's case. The gun has no blood on it. Right? This is a travesty of justice. Now, ultimately, Lori Ben Benick, after serving several years in prison, after escaping from prison, accepted a no contest deal that would allow her to not go back to prison. Okay, fair enough. I don't believe that no contest plea should be construed by anyone as an admission of guilt by Lori Benbenek. I believe the press has been too sidetracked by her looks, by her nickname, which I'm not going to say in this video, as opposed to looking at the evidence. Right? So put me among those who questions this verdict. Right? In my opinion, Lori Ben Benick should never have been tried for this case. Let me say this too. The prosecution relied on witnesses who came forward and tried to make the argument that Lori didn't care about the kids, was concerned herself about the money, etc. The question I have for you, the viewer, is does any of that evidence to you reach the level where it removes all of your doubts concerning Lori Ben Benick's guilt? Because of course, if you have any reasonable doubts, any whatsoever, then by law, you would have to vote to acquit. How did any majority of people in a jury room reach the conclusion that the prosecution on this evidence, where key prosecution witnesses disagree with their results, right? Where the prosecution is so shaky that they have people of interest actually collecting evidence, and then they don't quite properly have a chain of custody that has any credibility whatsoever. How could a jury take this prosecution seriously? Now I understand there was a John Doe investigation later and all this other stuff. Do you believe Lori Ben Benick would have been convicted today? I don't. Anyway, that's how I see the case. I think it's a travesty of justice. Tell all of us how you see the case. Let me say this too. I have an open invitation. Consider this an open invitation to anyone who was involved in the case, right? If you testified at the trial, if you conducted the autopsy, right? If you were one of the witnesses, right? one of the kids at the time, right? If you were ever a person of interest, if you were questioned by police, Fred Schultz, Durfee, right? If you were any of the principals in this case, if you send me a video of your thoughts and conclusions on the case, or if you send me a link to a video you've posted online or here on YouTube with your thoughts on the case. I'll post that video or I'll put up that link unedited here for the public to judge for themselves, right? That includes if you were a prosecutor in the case, right? Feel free to send me a video. Just understand my position. This is an absolute travesty. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.